So please let me introduce our speakers today. To my immediate left, Ray Arvidson, the robotic arm co-investigator from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. William Boynton is TIGA co-investigator from the University of Arizona. Mike Daly is MET Chief Engineer from M MDA in Toronto, Canada. David Spencer is Deputy Mission Manager from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And Leslie Tampery, Phoenix Project Scientist from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we're going to start with Dr. Arvidson. Ray? Hello, everybody. Well, we still very much like our landing site. You know, we brought you a place that was safe and in terms of not many rocks, big rocks, that was relatively flat. Uh, but we wanted a place that was scientifically interesting. And as you know, we touched down on a, a location that is just intensely dissected by pattern ground. And in fact, we're at a location where we think we can sample a polygon in a trough. And we're still evaluating that within the work volume. Now we've completed a 360 degree panorama called a site pan. The data were acquired on Sols 1 and 3. The train is so flat that what we're going to do is show you a movie in which we've taken the vertical dimension and stretched it out eight times to see the horizon. So this is what the pan actually looks like with pieces of spacecraft. And you can see the, the pattern ground and the small rocks distributed throughout. But now what we're going to see is not what you see with the eye, unless you were able to stretch out eight times. And there are no Himalayas off on the horizon. These are features that are kilometers away and that have relief only measured into 10 to 20 meters. So we're looking now off to the, the west. And as you know, about 30 kilometers away is the rim of this 10 kilometer crater Heimdall. But we can't see it because there's a gentle rise. But now we're kind of looking toward the south. And the feature that looks like it wants to be in the Himalayas is only about 20 to 30 meters high. And the parachute back shell and the, the heat shield impact site, those are you know, a couple hundred meters or, or less away. And then we'll continue panning off to the right. And we've actually used the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter context image data and high rise to identify those features and their distances. So the double peak there is um, more than 10 kilometers away. And we're looking at the meteorology mast um, sticking up. Those long, dark features in the near field are small rocks. Here comes my favorite feature, actually two favorite features. That's the actual scoop, the ISAD, the, the icy soil acquisition device, but stretched out eight times. And behind it, 5,000 meters away, is a gentle plateau that's filled with rocks. And that's one of the areas that actually showed up as a hazard in our, our hazard maps, but uh, wasn't a big deal in terms of, of landing because of the small area. And then swinging around and then, then finishing off. So again, this is really stretched vertically so we could see the features on the horizon. Now we want to move into a much closer zone, and that, as you know, we've deployed the robotic arm, checked out the robotic arm camera, and we took a picture of the blind spot that is the area the SSI can't see. So we see the foot pad, which, as you know, is about 20 centimeters across, and pieces of the spacecraft. And if you look in the upper portion of the frame in the middle, there are those three tabular surfaces that are exposed. We don't know what they are. They could be exposures of ice, or they could be exposures of rock. What we have is what you see. So what we're going to do over the next few sols is go back with the robotic arm and the robotic arm camera and get closer in shadow and turn on the blue, green, and red LEDs so we can get some color data. So we, this is really scientific method. This is exploration and discovery. So we either discovered ice or not. But what we want to do is go back and, and test this. And we have uncovered other areas on Mars during landings. The, the final slide is taking you back to 1976. Uh, believe it or not, a picture I actually took. And this is Viking Lander 1. And we're looking at um, very close to the lander. The left side is the housing for the surface sampler arm. And if you look beneath it, that's where Engine 2 has blown away some soil. And you can see that there's a crusty polygonal material underneath. That is not ice. That is dura crust. And we found by sampling in other places that it's enriched in magnesium and sulfur. So we've had some process where water is wicked up 
and left behind salts. So we have scientific method in front of us. We have two hypotheses. We have rock, we have ice. We're really pushing for ice, but we don't know if that's the case yet. And the real way to do this is to continue to look at this feature and then get out to the work volume and get the soil and expose whatever ice is underneath and see if we see a similar tabular shallow structure that we can sample and bring the material back into the spacecraft to really nail and test the hypothesis of ice versus rock. But this is pretty exciting because we expect ice only a few centimeters beneath the surface, so everything's consistent, but it could be rock, but remains to be seen in the next few weeks which is which. And let me introduce my partner, Bill Boynton, who will talk about TIGA. Yes, I'd like to talk about the TIGA instrument. TIGA stands for a Thermal and Evolved Gas Analyzer. And what this instrument is, is a device that's actually going to analyze these uh, ice or rock samples that we may uh, pick up from the surface. Essentially, we put the sample um, into a very small oven. Uh, we close the oven, heat it up very carefully, and we look at any gas vapors that are given off from it. We have a device called an evolved gas analyzer that looks at uh, these gases. And by uh, studying what, what the vapors are, we can tell what we put into the oven. For example, if there is any ice, we'll get some water vapor coming off at very low temperatures. And we actually do a process called calorimetry where we actually measure the amount of heat that it takes to warm the sample up. And if there's ice in the sample, it takes quite a bit more heat to melt the ice than it does just to uh, heat up some dry dirt. So uh, we're anxious to get on with measuring that. Uh, we did have a concern, though, in the data that came down yesterday. What we found was a, uh, an anomaly that looks like we have a, a short circuit in the ion source. The ion source is a part of the evolved gas analyzer that actually uh, generates the ions that we analyze, and this short circuit is intermittent. Uh, we are working on some diagnostic packages that we'll send up in the next few days, and we're actually quite optimistic that we have a workaround that will allow us to operate the instrument with nearly the full uh, capabilities that we had when it left the, left the ground. Uh, but right now, we don't know for sure, and it'll be uh, some time before we actually uh, get to the bottom of this. Okay, now I'd like to turn things over to uh, Mike, who will talk about the meteorology package. All right. I'm very pleased to report that the uh, weather station had a very successful sol on Mars with a full sol's worth of high-resolution temperature and pressure data and a 15-minute noontime LIDAR measurement, which is our second and longest. So if we could go to the first slide, we'll look at the, the weather report for today. Really, the weather is very similar to the previous day, except the, uh, we have increasing dust activity, which is leading to lower visibility. So we have a high for the day of minus 30 degrees Celsius and a low of minus 80 degrees Celsius or minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit. The pressure is at 8.5 millibars, and we had no wind measurements for the day. If we could go to the next slide. We, uh, we have a very nice animation of the, uh, of the LIDAR uh, to show you. This will show you the LIDAR in operation and we'll move on to some data from there. You can see the, the optical components of the LIDAR in that, are in that white shoebox sized object. The dust cover opens, exposing the transmitters and receivers.